Hi everyone, happy Monday. Um, I hope you all enjoyed the beautiful weekend that we had. Um, and I'm sure that all of you have heard that we unfortunately won't be going back to the building for the rest of the year. So we're going to finish off our unit um, with this remote learning. So I'm going to try my best to continue to give you as much information as possible so that we can best understand this novel, To Kill a Mockingbird. So for uh, homework, I ask you to read up to chapter 9. Today we're going to pick up on chapter 10 together, and then we'll be very close to done with part 1 of the story. So if you take a look at your screen, I have a chapter 7 summary. I just want to briefly talk about a few key points that I hope you were able to pick up on as you were reading, and then tie this into our objective for chapter 10. So if you take a look at your screen for chapter 7, it says a few days later, um, after school had begun again, remember that Scout is in second grade, Jem tells Scout that he found his pants fixed and hung over the fence. So we are going to assume that Boo Radley saw Jem and, uh, and Scout trying to get closer to him, found the pants after his brother shot that rifle in the air, and tried to do something nice for Jem. So on their way home from school, they found another present in the tree. They found a ball of gray twin. Uh, they leave it for a few days, but when no one claims it, they figure that it must be for them and they keep it. Scout still hates school in second grade, and Jem assures her that things will get better as she gets older, and she talks about the Dewey Decimal System and whatnot. And then late in the fall, another present is found in the tree. They find two soap figures that look like Scout and Jem, and then more presents follow. They find gum, a spelling bee metal, and Atticus explains to them that many years ago there used to be a spelling bee um, in the town. And they also find an old pocket watch, which is going to be important, and I'll talk to you guys a little bit about that later on. Then the next day, the hole has been filled with cement, and Jem and, and Scout are pretty upset about it. And when they ask Boo Radley's brother, Nathan, why he's doing that, or why he did, he says that the tree is dying. So as it's very typical for the children to do, they want to ask their father. And first, Atticus says that he doesn't believe the tree is dying. But if Nathan Radley said that it is, it probably is. So this brings us to chapter 8. School is closed in, May Co in Maycomb County for the first time um, because it's snowing out. And so Atticus wakes uh, Scout up and she sees the snow and she screams out that the world must be ending. And this is so important because it's a little ironic. Up through chapter 7, Scout's world is very familiar to her. She's well aware of the world um, as she knows it, but it's after chapter 7, beginning chapter 8 and on, that everything that she thought she knew begins to change. And in order for her to mature, in order for her to continue to grow, she's going to have to see things from a different perspective. So the kids don't go to school Jem tries to make a snowman, and he wants to make it look like Mr. Avery, who is that unpleasant old man that lives um, at, the end of the, at the end of the street, and Atticus tells them to disguise it. He, again, Atticus doesn't like his kids to make fun of other people. So what's ironic about this is that the children, or at least Jem, is really trying to make like this mud man. So we have to think about um, the idea of the whites and the blacks. And it's not until Jem can create this snowman that it's kind of acceptable. So this is starting to hint at one of the themes from the novel. Um, and one of the reasons why Scout is having such a hard time keeping her promise to her father that she's not going to fight. The, the children find out that their father is going to defend a black man, Tom Robinson, um, and this, you know, this idea, this theme of black and white, of discrimination, is going to begin to, to play in. While the kids are enjoying their time off from school, later that night, Miss Maudie's house catches on fire and it burns to the ground. The kids are so... 
um, caught up in everything that's going on in the town that as they're standing off to the side watching everything, they miss the opportunity to see Boo Radley, who came over and placed a blanket over them to keep them warm. Ironically, Miss Monty is not too upset that her house burned down because she says she hated her own home and wants a small home with a big garden. Here, Scout says that even birds know where to migrate to when it gets too cold. And this begins then the next theme in the story and one of the symbols, the symbol of birds. The title of our story here is To Kill a Mockingbird and now Scout begins to uh, make reference to, to birds. So I also want you to keep in mind that Scout's last name, Atticus and Gems as well, is Finch, which is the name of a bird. So chapter nine has Scout going back to, to school and people, including her enemy, uh, Cecile Jacobs, is upset because her father, Atticus, is defending, as they say in the story, niggers. So, Atticus has asked his daughter not to fight with her hands, but to fight with her mind. And so she needs to keep that in mind and hold everything um, so she doesn't fight Cecile Jacobs. However, during Christmas, Uncle Jack comes and he gives the kids a gift. He gives them air rifles. And uh, it's during this time that Scout's cousin comes to visit as well, her aunt's daughter, and is also making fun of their father. And so Scout says, I made a promise to my dad not to fight people, but family is a different matter. And so she tries to fight her cousin, Francis. Um, so these are some of the things that I wanted you to, uh, to keep in mind from the three chapters that I asked you to, to read. Today we're going to put into perspective the idea of Tom, um, Tom Robinson and the, the, the trial that Atticus is going to be defending him in, as well as the idea of To Kill a Mockingbird. So let's take a look at chapter 10 together. And, um, you know, I'll stop a couple of times to explain some of the important events. So if you have your, uh, your PDF version of the story, you can kind of follow along with me. I just wanted to give you the page number, which is page 48. And that's the beginning of chapter, chapter 10. So before we start, I also want to mention this word feeble here. Somebody who is feeble doesn't have a physical strength anymore, usually because of age. Atticus was feeble. He was nearly 50. When Jim and I asked them why he was so old, he said he got started late, which we felt reflected upon his abilities and manliness. He was much older than the parents of our school contemporaries, and there was nothing Jim or I could say about him when our classmates said, My father, Jim was football crazy. Atticus was never too tired to play keep away, but when Jim wanted to tackle him, Atticus would say, I'm too old for that, son. Our father didn't do anything. He worked in an office, not in a drugstore. Atticus did not drive a dump truck for the county. He was not the sheriff. He did not farm, work in a garage, or do anything that could possibly arouse the admiration of anyone. So I want to stop there and highlight this because I think it's important to understand um, Scout's opinion of her father at the beginning of this. So I'm going to go ahead and highlight that um, if this works for me. And here on the side, I just want to write that this is Scout's opinion of her father. So remember that she's looking at this um, reflecting upon this as an adult, this here that we highlighted is her opinion of her father as as a younger um, as a younger girl. Let's take a look um, a little closer at this. Um, she says that her father didn't do anything. We know that um, Atticus is a lawyer, so he does do something. 
Um, she says that he works in an office and not in a drugstore. He doesn't drive a dump truck for the county. He's not the sheriff and he doesn't farm. And because he doesn't do any of these things, he isn't admired by anyone. So we can then infer that a lot of Scout's friends or the people that go to school with her talk about their parents working at a drugstore or maybe some of their parents are farmers. And because a lot of people share these same, um, I guess, work qualities or, or, or characteristics, um, Scout feels left out. And therefore, she doesn't feel that anything her father does is worth any type of admiration. Besides that, he wore glasses. He was nearly blind in his left eye and said left eyes were the tribal curse of the finches. Whenever he wanted to see something well, he turned his head and looked from his right eye. He did not do the things our schoolmates' fathers did. He never went hunting. He did not play poker or fish or drink or smoke. He sat in the living room and read. Now, keep in mind that the fact that Atticus reads is important to Scout because she is able to read way before all of her classmates do. So although she doesn't admit it here, the fact that her father reads is something that's important to Scout. But let's take a look and see how um, Scout's opinion of her father either continues or changes in this chapter. With these attributes, however, he would not remain as inconspicuous as we wished him to. That year, the school buzzed with talk about him defending Tom Robinson, none of which was complimentary. After my bout with Cecil Jacobs when I committed myself to a policy of cowardice, word got around that Scout Finch wouldn't fight anymore. Her daddy wouldn't let her. This was not entirely correct. I wouldn't fight publicly for Atticus, but the family was private ground. I would fight anyone from a third cousin upwards, tooth and nail. Francis Hancock, for example, knew that. When he gave us our air rifles, Atticus wouldn't teach us to shoot. Uncle Jack instructed us in the rudiments thereof. He said Atticus wasn't interested in guns. Atticus said to Jim one day, I'd rather you shot at tin cans in the backyard, but I know you'll go after birds. Shoot all the blue jays you want if you can hit them, but remember... It's a sin to kill a mockingbird. So this is the first mention of the title, and I want us to um, make a note of that. So the kids receive these air rifles from their uncle, Jack, and here um, Atticus tells them, you know, especially Jem, I know you're going to want to shoot something. I would rather it be tin cans because they're not. Shoot all the blue jays, all these types of, uh, all this this particular type of a bird as much as you want, but remember that it's a sin to kill a mockingbird. So now we need to find out why. So I'm just going to write that in here so that I remember to go back. Why is it a sin to kill a mockingbird? And I'll fix that so that we can look at that better. All right, so let's continue on and see why Atticus believes it's a sin to kill a mockingbird. That was the only time I ever heard Atticus say it was a sin to do something, and I asked Miss Maudie about it. Your father's right, she said. Mockingbirds don't do one thing but make music for us to enjoy. They don't eat up people's gardens, don't nest in corn cribs. They don't do one thing but sing their hearts out for us. That's why it's a sin to kill a mockingbird. So let's go ahead and highlight the answer. Mockingbirds don't do anything but provide music for us to enjoy. So this is important because we need to dive in a little deeper um, to understand the meaning behind this. Mockingbirds only provide something that we can enjoy. Why would it be a sin to kill something like a mockingbird? This is where I want us to think about parallel structure. Harper Lee, the author, is beginning to establish a connection, a parallel. We talked about parallelism in class, right? Parallel lines never meet, but they do travel 
um, similar to, to each other. So here we have the title, uh, To Kill a Mockingbird. We have the conflict that Scout is discussing in this chapter, that her father doesn't do anything that's admirable. And then we have this idea of something that causes no harm to anyone, yet people would like to kill it. So Atticus, as well as Miss Maudie, established that that's not right. So let's continue on. Miss Maudie, this is an old neighborhood, ain't it? Been here longer than the town. No, I mean the folks on our street are all old. Jim and me's the only children around here. Mrs. DeBose is close on to a hundred. Miss Rachel's old, and so are you and Atticus. I don't call 50 very old, said Miss Molly tartly. Not being wheeled around yet, am I? Neither's your father. But I must say, Providence was kind enough to burn down that old mausoleum of mine. I'm too old to keep it up. Maybe you're right, Jean Louise. This is a settled neighborhood. You've never been around young folks much, have you? Yes, sir. At school. I mean young grown-ups. You're lucky, you know. You and Jim have the benefit of your father's age. If your father was 30... You'd find life quite different. So I want to stop here because this again is pointing out the importance of perspective. Remember that I told you in the previous chapters you read, Scout thought that the world was ending. And I discussed the irony behind that because in these next chapters, the world as Scout knows it is going to begin to change. And so this is the first reference that we get. If she had a different type of father, maybe then she would see life differently. So I want to go ahead and highlight that. Okay, And on the side here, I'm going to write for us uh, perspective. And we'll come back to that a little later on. I sure would. Atticus can't do anything. You'd be surprised, said Miss Maudie. There's life in him yet. What can he do? Well, he can make somebody's will so airtight can't anybody meddle with it. Shoot. Well, did you know he's the best checker player in this town? Why, down at the landing when we were coming up, Atticus Finch could beat everybody on both sides of the river. Good Lord, Miss Maudie, Jim and me beat him all the time. It's about time you found out it's because he lets you. Did you know he could play a Jew's harp? This modest accomplishment served to make me even more ashamed of him. Well, she said. Well, what, Miss Maudie? Well, nothing. Nothing. It seems with all that, you'd be proud of him. Can't everybody play a Jew's harp? Now keep out of the way of the carpenters. You better go home. I'll be in my azaleas and can't watch you. Plank might hit you. I went to the backyard and found Jim plugging away at a tin can, which seemed stupid with all the blue jays around. I returned to the front yard and busied myself for two hours erecting a complicated breastworks at the side of the porch, consisting of a tire, an orange crate, the laundry hamper, the porch chairs, and a small U.S. flag Jim gave me from a popcorn box. When Atticus came home to dinner, he found me crouched down, aiming across the street. What are you shooting at? Miss Maudie's rear end? Atticus turned and saw my generous target bending over her bushes. He pushed his hat to the back of his head and crossed the street. Maudie, he called. I thought I'd better warn you. You're in considerable peril. Miss Maudie straightened up and looked toward me. She said, Atticus, you are a devil from hell. When Atticus returned, he told me to break camp. Don't you ever let me catch you pointing that gun at anybody again, he said. I wished my father was a devil from hell. I sounded out Calpurnia on the subject. Mr. Finch? Why, he can do lots of things. Like what? I asked. Calpurnia scratched her head. Well, I don't rightly know, she said. Jim underlined it when he asked Atticus if he was going out for the Methodist, and Atticus said he'd break his neck if he did. He was just too old for that sort of thing. The Methodists were trying to pay off their church mortgage and had challenged the Baptists to a game of touch football. Everybody in town's father was playing, it seemed, except Atticus. 
Jim said he didn't even want to go, but he was unable to resist football in any form, and he stood gloomily on the sidelines with Atticus and me, watching Cecil Jacobs' father make touchdowns for the Baptists. One Saturday, Jim and I decided to go exploring with our air rifles to see if we could find a rabbit or a squirrel. We'd gone about 500 yards beyond the Radley place when I noticed Jim squinting at something down the street. He had turned his head to one side and was looking out of the corners of his eyes. What you looking at? That old dog down yonder, he said. That's old Tim Johnson, ain't it? Yeah. Tim Johnson was the property of Mr. Harry Johnson, who drove the Mobile bus and lived on the southern edge of town. Tim was a liver-colored bird dog, the pet of Maycomb. What's he doing? I don't know, Scout. We'd better go home. Oh, Jim, it's February. I don't care. I'm going to tell Cal. We raced home and ran to the kitchen. Cal, said Jim, can you come down the sidewalk a minute? What for, Jim? I can't come down the sidewalk every time you want me. There's something wrong with an old dog down yonder. Calpurnia sighed. I can't wrap up any dog's foot now. There's some gauze in the bathroom. Go get it and do it yourself. Jim shook his head. He's sick, Cal. Something's wrong with him. What's he doing, trying to catch his tail? No, he's doing like this. Jim gulped like a goldfish, hunched his shoulders, and twitched his torso. He's going like that, only not like he means to. Are you telling me a story, Jim Finch? Calpurnia's voice hardened. No, Cal, I swear I'm not. Was he running? No, he's just moseying along so slow you can't hardly tell it. He's coming this way. Calpurnia rinsed her hands and followed Jim into the yard. I don't see any dog, she said. She followed us beyond the Radley place and looked where Jim pointed. Tim Johnson was not much more than a speck in the distance, but he was closer to us. He walked erratically, as if his right legs were shorter than his left legs. He reminded me of a car stuck in a sand bed. He's gone lopsided, said Jim. Calpurnia stared, then grabbed us by the shoulders and ran us home. She shut the wood door behind us, went to the telephone, and shouted, Give me Mr. Finch's office. Mr. Finch, she shouted. This is Cal. I swear to God there's a mad dog down the street apiece. He's coming this way. Yes, sir, he's... Mr. Finch, I declare he is old Tim Johnson. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes. She hung up and shook her head when we tried to ask her what Atticus had said. She rattled the telephone hook and said, Miss Eula May? Now, ma'am, I'm through talking to Mr. Finch. Please don't connect me no more. Listen, Miss Eula May, can you call Miss Rachel and Miss Stephanie Crawford and whoever's got a phone on the street and tell them a mad dog's coming? Please, ma'am. So this, I'm just going to stop here to just, um, you know, talk briefly about the the phone situation. So during this time, you didn't actually have a phone number that you just dialed and connected directly. You had uh, you had an operator, and that operator, Miss Eula May in this instance, would then connect you to somebody else. So Miss Eula May, being the operator, can then call into people's homes and just give them this message rather than Calpurnia calling each individual person. Now, they do mention something about it being February, and um, they're going to explain what that is in a few paragraphs. Calpurnia, listen. I know it's February, Miss Eula May, but I know a mad dog when I see one. Please, ma'am, hurry. Calpurnia asked Jim. Radley's got a phone? Jim looked in the book and said no. They won't come out anyway, Cal. I don't care. I'm going to tell them. She ran to the front porch. Jim and I at her heels. You stay in that house, she yelled. Calpurnia's message had been received by the neighborhood. Every wood door within our range of vision was closed tight. We saw no trace of Tim Johnson. We watched Calpurnia running toward the Radley place, holding her skirt and apron above her knees. She went up to the front steps and banged on the door. She got no answer, and she shouted, Mr. Nathan! Mr. Arthur! Mad Dog's coming! Mad Dog's coming! She's supposed to go around and back, I said. Jim shook his head. Don't make any difference now, he said. Calpurnia pounded on the door in vain. No one acknowledged her warning. No one seemed to have heard it. As Calpurnia sprinted to the back porch, a black Ford swung into the driveway. Atticus and Mr. Heck Tate got out. 
Mr. Heck Tate was the sheriff of Makeup County. He was as tall as Atticus, but thinner. He was long-nosed, wore boots with shiny metal eye holes, boot pants and a lumber jacket. His belt had a row of bullets sticking in it. He carried a heavy rifle. When he and Atticus reached the porch, Jim opened the door. Stay inside, son, said Atticus. Where is he, Cal? He ought to be here by now, said Calpurnia, pointing down the street. Not running, is he? asked Mr. Tate. No, sir, he's in the twitching stage, Mr. Heck. Should we go after him, Heck? asked Atticus. We better wait, Mr. Finch. They usually go in a straight line, but you never can tell. He might follow the curve. Hope he does, or he'll go straight in the Radley backyard. Let's wait a minute. Don't think he'll get in the Radley yard, said Atticus. Vince will stop him. He'll probably follow the road. I thought mad dogs foamed at the mouth, galloped, leaped, and lunged at throats, and I thought they did it in August. Had Tim Johnson behaved thus, I would have been less frightened. Nothing is more deadly than a deserted, waiting street. The trees were still. The mockingbirds were silent. The carpenters at Miss Maudie's house had vanished. I heard Mr. Tate sniff, then blow his nose. I would have been less frightened. Nothing is more deadly than a deserted, waiting street. The trees were still. The mockingbirds were silent. The carpenters at Miss Maudie's house had vanished. I heard Mr. Tate sniff, then blow his nose. I saw him shift his gun to the crook of his arm. I saw Miss Stephanie Crawford's face framed in the glass window of her front door. Miss Maudie appeared and stood beside her. Atticus put his foot on the rung of a chair and rubbed his hand slowly down the side of his thigh. So the recording skipped and repeated something, um, so I apologize for that. But one thing that I do want to um, point out to you before we continue is what Scout says. She says in the previous paragraph, I thought mad dogs foamed at the mouth and that they did so in August. So remember in the beginning of the chapter, I said that uh, Scout's perspective or the things that she thought she knew are going to begin to change um, throughout this uh, throughout this story. So here, this is one example. And now they're waiting for the sheriff to be able to do something about this mad dog. There he is, he said softly. Tim Johnson came into sight, walking dazedly in the inner rim of the curve, parallel to the Radley house. Look at him, whispered Jim. Mr. Heck said they walked in a straight line. He can't even stay in the road. He looks more sick than anything, I said. Let anything get in front of him and he'll come straight at it. Mr. Tate put his hand to his forehead and leaned forward. He's got it all right, Mr. Finch. Tim Johnson was advancing at a snail's pace, but he was not playing or sniffing at foliage. He seemed dedicated to one course and motivated by an invisible force that was inching him toward us. We could see him shiver like a horse shedding flies. His jaw opened and shut. He was a list, but he was being pulled gradually toward us. He's looking for a place to die, said Jim. Mr. Tate turned around. He's far from dead, Jim. He hasn't got started yet. Tim Johnson reached the side street that ran in front of the Radley place, and what remained of his poor mind made him pause and seem to consider which road he would take. He made a few hesitant steps and stopped in front of the Radley gate. Then he tried to turn around, but was having difficulty. Attica said, He's within range, Heck. You better get him now before he goes down the side street. Lord knows who's around the corner. Go inside, Cal. Calpurnia opened the screen door, latched it behind her, then unlatched it and held on to the hook. She tried to block Jim and me with her body, but we looked out from beneath her arms. Take him, Mr. Finch. Mr. Tate handed the rifle to Atticus. Jim and I nearly fainted. Don't waste time, Heck, said Atticus. Go on. So the kids are obviously pretty uh, baffled to see the sheriff, again, someone that they would feel is something um, admirable to, a job that's admirable to have, versus their father. Um, he hands Atticus the rifle and wants Atticus to be the one to shoot the dog. Um, so here, Jem and I nearly fainted. Mr. Finch, this is a one-shot job. Atticus shook his head vehemently. Don't just stand there, Heck. 
He won't wait all day for you. For God's sake, Mr. Finch, look where he is. Miss, and you'll go straight into the Radley house. I can't shoot that well, and you know it. I haven't shot a gun in 30 years. Mr. Tate almost threw the rifle at Atticus. I'd feel mighty comfortable if you did now, he said. In a fog, Jim and I watched our father take the gun and walk out into the middle of the street. He walked quickly, but I thought he moved like an underwater swimmer. Time had slowed to a nauseating crawl. So this is a beautiful um, sentence here by Scout, right? She says, in a fog, she watched her father take the gun and walk into the middle of the street. He walked quickly, but I thought he moved like an underwater swimmer. So hopefully that paints a good picture in your mind as how, you know, how smoothly um, uh, Atticus is doing this. So Atticus hasn't shot a gun in 30 years, and he only has one shot to, uh, to kill this dog. When Atticus raised his glasses, Calpurnia murmured, Sweet Jesus, help him, and put her hands to her cheeks. Atticus pushed his glasses to his forehead. They slipped down, and he dropped them in the street. In the silence, I heard them crack. Atticus rubbed his eyes and chin. We saw him blink hard. In front of the Radley Gate, Tim Johnson had made up what was left of his mind. He had finally turned himself around to pursue his original course up our street. He made two steps forward, then stopped and raised his head. We saw his body go rigid. With movements so swift, they seemed simultaneous. Atticus's hand yanked a ball-tipped lever as he brought the gun to his shoulder. The rifle cracked. Tim Johnson leaped flopped over and crumpled on the sidewalk in a brown and white heap. He didn't know what hit him. Mr. Tate jumped off the porch and ran to the Radley place. He stopped in front of the dog, squatted, turned around, and tapped his finger on his forehead above his left eye. You were a little to the right, Mr. Finch, he called. So here we see that Atticus uh, was able to kill the, the dog with one shot, and again, because he doesn't see very well from one eye, he was just slightly to the right. Um, and apparently this is something that he does all of the time. So we can imagine Scout and Jem's astonishment when they see that their father was able to, to shoot and, and kill the dog. Always was, answered Atticus. If I had my druthers, I'd take a shotgun. He stooped and picked up his glasses ground the broken lenses to powder under his heel, and went to Mr. Tate and stood looking down at Tim Johnson. Doors opened one by one, and the neighborhood slowly came alive. Miss Maudie walked down the steps with Miss Stephanie Crawford. Jim was paralyzed. I pinched him to get him moving, but when Atticus saw us coming, he called, Stay where you are. When Mr. Tate and Atticus returned to the yard, Mr. Tate was smiling. I'll have Zebo collect him, he said. You haven't forgot much, Mr. Finch. They say it never leaves you. Atticus was silent. Atticus, said Jim. Yes. Nothing. I saw that one shot, Finch. Atticus wheeled and faced Miss Maudie. They looked at one another without saying anything, and Atticus got into the sheriff's car. Come here, he said to Jim. Don't you go near that dog. You understand? Don't go near him. He's just as dangerous dead as alive. Yes, sir, said Jim. Atticus? What, son? Nothing. What's the matter with you, boy? Can't you talk? Said Mr. Tate, grinning at Jim. Didn't you know your daddy's? Hush, heck, said Atticus. Let's go back to town. So, again, Jim is shocked to see that his father is such a good uh, shooter and Mr. Tate tried to, um, to reiterate that. He wanted to say, didn't you know that your daddy's, um, and he wanted to use a particular name that they have for Atticus Finch, which we'll find out in a couple of paragraphs. And uh, Atticus tells him to, to be quiet, not to say anything. So we want to kind of find out why Atticus is um, reluctant to have his children know that he's such a good shooter. And obviously, Miss Maudie knew this, um, that's why he and her looked at each other while he was getting in the car. When they drove away, Jim and I went to Miss Stephanie's front steps. We sat waiting for Zebo to arrive in the garbage truck. 
Jem sat in numb confusion, and Miss Stephanie said, Mm-mm-mm, who'd have thought of a mad dog in February? Maybe he wasn't mad. Maybe he was just crazy. I'd hate to see Harry Johnson's face when he gets in from the mobile run and finds Atticus Finch has shot his dog. But he was just full of fleas from somewhere. Miss Maudie said Miss Stephanie'd be singing a different tune if Tim Johnson was still coming up the street. But they'd find out soon enough. They'd send his head to Montgomery. Jim became vaguely articulate. Did you see him, Scott? Did you see him just standing there? And all of a sudden he just relaxed all over and it looked like that gun was a part of him. And he did it so quick like. I have to aim for ten minutes before I can hit something. Miss Maudie grinned wickedly. Well now, Miss Jean Louise, she said, still think your father can't do anything? Still ashamed of him? No, I said meekly. Forgot to tell you the other day that besides playing a juice harp, Atticus Finch was the deadest shot in Macomb County in his time. Dead shot, echoed Jim. That what I said, Jim Finch. Guess you'll change your tune now. The very idea. Didn't you know his nickname was Old One Shot when he was a boy? Why, down at the landing when he was coming up, if he shot 15 times and hit 14 does, he'd complain about wasted ammunition. So this is the name that they have for Atticus Finch. All one shot. He never said anything about that, Jim muttered. Never said anything about it, did he? No, ma'am. Wonder why he never goes hunting now, I said. Maybe I can tell you, said Miss Maudie. If your father's anything, he's civilized in his heart. Marksmanship's a gift of God, a talent. Oh, you have to practice to make it perfect, but shooting's different from playing the piano or the like. I think maybe he put his gun down when he realized that God had given him an unfair advantage over most living things. I guess he decided he wouldn't shoot till he had to, and he had to today. So this echoes what Atticus told his daughter, Scout, that instead of using her fist and instead of fighting, to use her head. So uh, Atticus realizes that he's able to, uh, to defend himself, to defend people, by using his mind. Um, and this is probably why he wanted to become uh, an attorney, a lawyer, rather than go around shooting things that, because of his talent, he's so easily able to do. Looks like he'd be proud of it, I said. People in their right minds never take pride in their talents, said Miss Molly. We saw Zebo drive up. He took a pitchfork from the back of the garbage truck and gingerly lifted Tim Johnson. He pitched the dog onto the truck, then poured something from a gallon jug on and around the spot where Tim fell. Don't y'all come over here for... At home, I told Jim we'd really have something to talk about at school on Monday. Jim turned on me. Don't say anything about it, Scout, he said. What? I certainly am. Ain't everybody's daddy the dead is shot in Macomb County. Jim said. I reckon if he wanted us to know it, he'd have told us. If he was proud of it, he'd have told us. Maybe it just slipped his mind, I said. No, Scout, it's something you wouldn't understand. Atticus is real old, but I wouldn't care if he couldn't do anything. I wouldn't care if he couldn't do a blessed thing. Jim picked up a rock and threw it jubilantly at the car house. Running after it, he called back. Atticus is a gentleman just like me. And that brings us 11. to the end of chapter 11.